It's six o'clock on a Tuesday morning in Lisbon. For this fish merchant, the most important part of her day is just wrapping up, buying the fish that she will later sell in the market. The boats that brought today's catch head back to sea while Portugal's capital city wakes up. Lisboa, as the Portuguese call it. For centuries, it and this entire country have turned to the sea, its one direct link to the rest of the world. Clinging to the edge of Europe, Portugal is a country that has long fought to maintain its own identity. Its people know their heritage and respect their connection with the sea the far-off waters that have provided food and a livelihood for a struggling nation. Since the 13th century, when their first explorers discovered the bounty of the bacalhau, the Portuguese word for cod, they have come to catch the ocean's gold off Newfoundland's coast. They came by the thousands to fish the Grand Banks, over the side in tiny boats, endless days for months on end, to earn a living from the sea. And while they were gone, another tiny country on the other side of the Atlantic became home. The docks of St. John's Harbor came alive with the Portuguese sailors of the White Fleet. For decades, they came to rest, to relax, and to repair in a safe port they called home. That whole nostalgic image seems like a faded memory now. Oh, they were here all right. Most people over 30 years of age or so will tell you they could be seen playing soccer here along the docks, drinking and shopping. Sometimes they even invited people on board their ships for a meal. Relationships developed, some even married. But in the last few years, a relationship that has been nurtured for decades has slipped away. In its place is a new image, that of two peoples torn apart by international conflict. <laughs> There's not much left of the White Fleet today, but you can still find some of the old rusting schooners in Aveiro, north of Lisbon, on the Atlantic seaboard. <laughs> This beautiful city was the departure point for many of the White Fleet, and many of the fleet's fishing sailors came from this area. One was Captain Fernando Carrancho, who first entered the Narrows of St. John's Harbor in 1957. St. John's was a small town, of course nice, with a beautiful people, Captain Carrancho says those were happier days. Now they seem like a long time ago. It all happened close to three years ago when the Portuguese government decided to join the European community. Canada was already fighting with the Europeans because of overfishing outside the 200 mile limit. When Portugal decided to join the community, it too became part of the ban. Carrancho says it destroyed a very friendly relationship with Canada that did more than its part to help the Newfoundland economy. I cannot forget the White Fleet, where I was captain in White Fleet, with the 50, 60 ships at the same time in the St. John's Harbor. Beautiful picture, but uh, also Plenty work to the people in St. John's. Gas oil, food, repair. All the relationship between all these people. That relationship is now at an all-time low because not only has Canada banned the Portuguese, they're only allowed in St. John's now to avoid storms, but they have also accused them in the international community of being one of the worst countries for overfishing outside the 200-mile limit. 
Captain Antonio Sal Marcos has just uh, returned from the nose and tail of the Grand Banks. Canada says you take too much fish. Uh, where? Outside limits? Yes. And why doesn't Canada say that uh, Russians and Cubans and Spanish take too much fish outside limits? Even there is a Japanese vessels working there, Korean vessels working there. Sal Marcos says Canada is turning a blind eye to the real offenders. But the thing that seems to bother him most in all this is being lumped in with the Spanish as two of the worst offenders outside the line. That, he says, is an insult. They, they, they should make a clear difference. Spanish is one thing. Portuguese are another thing completely different. We are two countries with different fishing politics, with different behavior. We are not going to pay for the Spaniards' faults. For the Portuguese, a very proud people, being put on the same level with the Spanish is just about the worst insult they can imagine. An old Portuguese saying goes, from Espanol, no good wind blows and no good marriage either. Their history has always bubbled on one side or the other of confrontational. But for all their differences, the cornerstone of the Portuguese defense is very similar to the Spanish, that they have an historical right to fish the North Atlantic, and that their people, with over half of their entire diet coming from the sea, would be the last ones to want to see the fish stocks destroyed. A country like Portugal, but can never accept the total destruction of a fishery. We depend on it. Commander Manuel Cunha, a senior advisor in the Portuguese government. He is quick to point out that better than 80% of the area where the straddling stocks, the biomass, congregates, is in Canadian jurisdiction. It's our understanding that if there is a problem, is with the Canadian fishing fleet inside of their own zone. Uh, so we are a bit surprised when every day uh, the press tells uh, that Portuguese and Spanish, Spanish speak for themselves, but we are speaking for the Portuguese, that we are damaging your own uh, uh, fishing. Uh, the truth is that uh, it's very small amount we catch in very small areas. Uh, the big thing is inside of your own zone. Uh. Tough words for the Canadian government to swallow. particularly in light of our own scientists' admittedly gross miscalculation of the size of the fish stocks. But there's more. When asked about catching juvenile fish, the Portuguese say their nets, like the Spanish, hold up to regular inspection under rules set down by the North Atlantic Fisheries Organization, of which Canada is a member. But who, they ask, is watching the Russians or the Cubans with their large factory freezers and fish meal plants running 24 hours a day? The Portuguese just can't understand why Canada has abandoned a relationship of decades and turned friendship into confrontation on the international stage. It's really a pity but that things come to this point, but we have to say it's not our fault. But we are here. We never, we not even prevent you guys pa, to export pa, salt cost to Portugal by the thousands, pa, containers after containers. Pa. We show to be friendly to Canadians. Pa. We don't understand the reason why Canadians pa, excluded us pa, from this uh, living together as before. Pa. The Portuguese fishing industry has been hurt by the Canadian campaign. They now send their boats to St. Pierre for food and fuel. Profits are lower, and in a poor country, that makes hard times that much tougher. And the pressure that's being put on vessel owners by the Canadians and the European community is having the same effect it had in Spain. This boat was tied up at the docks in Aviero. You can plainly see that she used to be registered in Lisbon. She now flies the Panamanian flag. New name, new country of origin, out of anybody's jurisdiction, but still owned by a Portuguese company. If you talk to an owner like Fernando Rabo, you find they see this as one of the few options they have left. And we are thinking about this strongly, because it's the way to continue fish. It's the only way. And it's very important for you. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes. My family is in, is in the business, fish business, 
uh, for a so long time ago. Yes, start with my grandfather and we can continue because we have the, the company, we have the, the people that work with us and you can continue. And that's the bottom line in the Portuguese perspective. They can and will continue using whatever means it takes. Being a poor country, the fishery is absolutely vital to them. On the other hand, they say everything about them is different from the Spanish, their way of life, their politics, and their respect for Canadians as a people. They say they also respect Canadian law and point out that unlike the Spanish, they have never been convicted of doing anything illegal in our waters. They know the simpler days of the White Fleet are gone forever, but they want what it represented to return. I have some friends, good friends in Newfoundland, and I understand that uh, all these problems don't start uh, in Newfoundland, but I think that, I am, I am sure that it uh, start uh, from Ottawa not from Newfoundland. It is not with the that crazy decision that Canada is going to avoid Portuguese fleet to fish outside the 200 mile limits. We are not aggravated personally one way to the other. Our politics, yes, they are in shock, you know. Canadians prove they are able to do and run their own policy the way they want. We prove that we are able to survive by this way. So this is more than time to start thinking uh, reason, reasonably. We have to remember what has been left behind. For Here and Now, I'm Red Sharon.